Hi, uh, th th thank you. Oh my. Uh, thank you so much for, for having me. My name is um, Paul Stewart. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the, the Moffitt Cancer Center. Um, I work in a, a lung cancer research lab that focuses on um, kinase signaling and phosphoproteomics. So we, we do a lot of, of proteomics um, in our lab. Um, my, my position is purely computational, so I, I mostly just analyze data um, for our lab. And part of that is developing some, some tools to sort of help out with that, with that process. So, so first of all, well, why, why proteomics? Um, proteomics is complementary to genomics, and we really think that you don't get the full picture, especially within cancer, which is the, the disease that we study, uh, without both of these technologies, right? So, so proteomics has this ability to help you understand tumor vulnerabilities, uh, lethal interactions, but, and also protein-protein interactions, which is what, what I want to talk about. But just as a side note, we're finding more and more that the, the message, the messenger RNA, does not correlate with total protein expression. And this is really, really strange. And this isn't just isolated to cancer. This is even within healthy, healthy tissues that we're finding more and more that the, the correlation is just, it's just bad. Um, if you look here, so this, uh, I don't think I have, a, I have a laser pointer. So if you look at the, the, the top, the top figure is actually a paper uh, from 2014. It was the CPTAC uh, Proteogenomics of Colon Cancer Project. They did, uh, I think, over 100 tumors. They did the, all the next-gen sequencing. They did proteomics. And they found the, the intra-sample correlation between messenger RNA and proteomics was 0.47. If they looked across all samples, then that correlation drops to a 0.2. So it's really, really unbelievable. Um, more recently, at the end of last year, we also did uh, a similar proteogenomics characterization of a small cohort of non-small cell lung cancer patients. And we, you know, big, big surprise, people are seeing this more and more. We, we found the same thing, where the correlation, if you look at that figure on the le uh, bottom left, there's really no correlation there. We have a correlation of 0 0.13 between the, the messenger RNA and the proteomics. And if we slice it and dice it a little bit differently, instead of doing a pairwise comparison, we can look at the means of everything across the board, you still end up with this figure on the bottom right, and that, that bumps the correlation up to a 0.34. This, this is Spearman, by the way, if anyone's, if anyone's asking. Uh, but it's still, it's still bad. Right, so, so really you need both genomics because you need to understand all of the, the, the mutational status copy numbers, but also proteomics to actually understand what is at the end of the day getting expressed. So uh, affinity proteomics, what is affinity proteomics? Affinity proteomics is just a method for understanding and characterizing protein-protein interactions. So you typically follow uh, a workflow that's up, that's up at the top, you have your model system, and you uh, want to look at some sort of a protein interaction, and you go, go through sort of uh, these steps. So you start off with what I call a, a bait protein, so almost like you're going fishing, right? So you can have this expressed in the cell, or you can engineer the protein and have it in a column, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we do this in the cells. And then you have your prey come along, so you can think of the, the fish. And they come along, and they bind to your protein. Well, you can do a pull down, and then you can characterize all of these praise by doing proteomics. And so you get a good idea of the protein-protein interactions that are occurring um, natively within the cell. How do, you, how do you characterize this? So, right, so a lot of proteins are very sticky. So how, how can you sort out what's a good interaction, what's a bad interaction? Uh, well, they have the software called SAINT. It's Significant Analysis of Interactomes. And basically, it, it just uses um, Bayesian. Uh, so you have to have a negative control on all of these experiments. And then, so basically, it's a Bayesian method, and you end up uh, making this in red. You, you end up with a null distribution, and then you have your actual experiments, which makes up that, you know, for example, this blue distribution. And then you can have an idea of sort of what's sort of just false positives and what's actually truly interaction, interaction within your data set. And say, we'll rank them and give each um, prey a score. Well, there's, there's, there's a problem, as I think this audience can really appreciate with, with, with Saint, uh, for biologists, it, it sort of creates a, there, there's, there's some pains here. So you're, you're dealing with these very large text files and lots of output, especially from proteomics experiments. You'll have lists of hundreds, if not thousands, of, of proteins or peptides. Um, you deal with non-verbose errors within this software. So as you're trying to load your data into this and you're setting up your experimental design, the, the error messages aren't particularly verbose, and there's a lot of question as to exactly what's wrong and why it's not working. And so there's, there's lots of headaches. Uh, additionally, I'm not sure if, if maybe this, this, this crowd uh, doesn't have to worry about it so much, but if, if you've put information into an Excel spreadsheet, there's a lot of auto formatting issues. So uh, septins, right, there's these proteins um, that they get mapped to September in your data set. And actually, you can go and look at some of these online databases, and they actually have the, the September date in there because Excel auto formatted their gene name to, 
to, um, to a date. So th there's, there's lots of issues to uh, contend with. So at the end of the day, um, we, we collaborate with the lab and we time this, and so it, t it takes about an hour to get all this set up and to get the, the software working for understanding your, your interactions coming from your data. And um, you know, this is this is just to give you a better idea that this is a slide that we, we, we sort of show show in one of our group meetings that yeah you're dealing with all of this data and you have to find where's the problem in here right so for, for biologists that's that's not that's not easy so uh, so there was Saint so we have now Apostle <laughs> um, this is this is essentially software that helps streamline this process and taking your data and making it super easy for a biologist to uh, take their data, their experimental design, press a button, and then go, right? So everyone knows that Galaxy is great, great for these workflows. So at the top is sort of the requirements. So you have to have your data processed in either uh, MaxQuant or, or Scaffold. Uh, MaxQuant is an in intensity-based proteomic software, but at the end of the day, you're, you're getting relative or absolute abundance of proteins in your sample. And the Scaffold does something similar, but instead of looking at uh, integration of peaks over time, it looks at that spectral counting. It's just, just a slightly different method for understanding what proteins are in your data. So all you need to do is have some data from one of these two pieces of software, and you need to have our tool installed in your Galaxy instance. So, so what does our tool do, and how does it work? So if you sort of look from left to right here, um, you're, you're supposed to have three files for, for Saint. Uh, and then, so basically you're taking your data from Max Quantor Scaffold, having to format it, break it up into three files, and it, it, right, it quickly becomes laborious for biologists. Um, so with, with our software, you essentially just give it the output directly from Max Quantor Scaffold, uh, and you tell us your experimental design, so it's essentially how your baits are set up, and then the, the software, excuse me, takes care of the rest. Uh, the most recent iteration of, of Saint is actually called Saint, Saint Express, but it's, it's essentially the same software. Uh, the software then goes and it queries the crap ohm, which is actually a real thing. I, I didn't just make that up. So it's the, the contaminant repository for affinity proteomics, the crap ohm. You go to crapohm.org and actually see it. So there's a lot of these sticky proteins that show up in affinity proteomics experiments, and they're just there all the time. So that's probably a false positive that they're showing up in your data. So someone had the bright idea, we should start tracking all of these and have a repository so that when someone does one of these experiments, you can actually see what's, what's probably a crap ohm. Then you can do some interactive analysis. Um, so we take um, so some of the output that's coming from Galaxy and we essentially pipe it into a shiny environment, which I'll get into in a second. And then you can do some of these other visualization techniques. Uh, you can outport directly into a Cytoscape for looking at protein-protein interactions. Uh, you can query uh, the consensus path database for understanding these protein-protein interactions. And this is just sort of our, our, our deployment. So uh, right now, you can go on the tool shed and grab some of these tools yourself. We also have uh, all the code on, on GitHub as well as Docker. And as of like last Friday, we, I finally, after six weeks of fighting with IT, we have our test server up now. So this is uh, not a very beefy virtual machine, but it is there so that um, people and also the reviewers for this, this manuscript can go and check out the tool without having to go through all the trouble of installing it themselves. And this is just a picture of the GitHub repository. We even have a logo for Apostle. And um, there's a pretty lengthy walkthrough with, with screenshots and everything. So I'm very big on, uh, this comes from graduate school. I had to do a lot of um, tutorial design and, and making documents for undergraduates to follow. And so uh, we, we think it's fairly well documented with lots of screenshots and um, potential pitfalls and, and other things that you might run into. And this is, I guess this is just a picture of, of it on the, the Galaxy tool shed. And then, so this is actually optional, right? So we are at a Galaxy conference, and so our tool uh, essentially creates output. So if you set up your server to be running both Galaxy and Shiny, uh, Galaxy can essentially hand off the, the data that it outputs right into this, this Shiny environment. So it's an interactive environment. It's not a true Galaxy interactive environment, but it still allows you to do dynamic images, and you can see that there's slider bars over there. So you can adjust your cutoffs and look for, look for other, ah, thank you. You can, uh, you can adjust your cutoffs, and then uh, the, the data will update in real time. And then so we have a lot of sort of your atypical visualization techniques. You can look at correlation between your replicates. You can do um, box and whisker plots, uh, look at the distribution of your data. Uh, some of these bubble graphs, which I'll show you a sec in a second, is a great way for visualizing some of this affinity proteomics data. Um, we have uh, Cytoscape JS support. Oh, so normally you can just do all this in R and press the button. If you have a shiny server, this website will appear. Uh, we tweaked it a little tiny bit using some HTML and JavaScript just to get Cytoscape JS working. So within this environment, we also have essentially a mini Cytoscape browser too, right? Because you're looking at protein-protein interactions, and so we, we think it's helpful. 
And then finally, you can also do um, pathway queries. So this um, can, will connect to consensus path, it'll connect to keg, and you can actually do an enrichment and actually see what's, what's in your data. And the same thing with, with gene ontology. So to validate the tool, uh, right, we're a lung cancer lab, so we were looking at these, these cell lines. So we have a naive cell line and then the erlotinib resistant cell line. Uh, erlotinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, uh, targets EGFR, right? Well, why, why lung cancer, right? So, so it's a, the number one killer of, of Americans with, with cancer. You know, like 100,000, 150,000 Americans die each year from lung cancer. And so there are some targeted therapies, but in lung cancer, you quickly develop a resistance to the targeted therapies, and then you have to move sort of to the next line. So this, this model is, um, uh, basically this model can be used to try to understand some of the mechanisms that cause resistance, and maybe that can help you therapeutically overcome them uh, with patients. Uh, so the experimental setup is that we have both of these cell lines. They've both been engineered uh, with lentivirus to express uh, all of these proteins. You'll also notice they're going to express GFP2, which is going to serve as our negative control, because in mammalian cells, you really wouldn't expect GFP to be interacting with anything. And then so it's going to essentially serve for us as a basis of comparison. Anything sticking to GFP that's also present in the rest of the data is probably a false positive. So we can do this comparison. Uh, in this case, our, our, our institution is a very big fan of, of MaxQuant, so we use MaxQuant. Uh, this data can go directly into Galaxy. Uh, we did an extra step, so trying to predict sort of some reviewer comments where we do a normalization step. But you can really take your, your data directly from one of these two softwares, MaxQuant or Scaffold, into Galaxy, and then it'll go right through the analysis. Um, one issue with uh, MaxQuant is that um, it'll assign um, peptide intensities, but there's this multiple mapping, pro uh, mul multiple mapping problem, right? So you can have one peptide can go to any number of proteins. Uh, so we borrow this uh, method. It's essentially from genomics where it's this weighted mean, and we essentially try to approximate the actual expression of a protein given all these different peptides that go to all these different potential proteins. But at the end of the day, we can then do our apostle analysis. And then, so these figures are actually generated from our, our shiny tool. Uh, some of them are available in Galaxy, but uh, a lot of the visualizations are only available uh, in shiny. So you can, like I said, you can look at the correlation between your replicates. Uh, I think we just picked a random protein here just to show off that yes, indeed, you can do a box plot and then have it represented in all the different samples. Uh, you can look at distribution. And then you can do network analysis. So, so this, um, was exported from our tool. We, we sort of cleaned it up and prettified it a little bit for visualization on the big screen, so doing some of these colors. So, so uh, we can export a cytoscape file from our tool, and we essentially just colored some of these nodes so that you can know sort of what, what all these proteins um, correspond to. And then so we have the, all the proteins here that were highlighted that either come from the, the parental or the, the, the naive and the resistant cell lines. And this was, we, we were fairly loose with, with our cutoffs. We just wanted to make sure everything was working. We can get a, a sense of what the data looked like. Uh, but we can do another pass with this and then be very stringent with our, very, be very stringent with our cutoffs. And then also do one of these bubble plots that I was telling you about. So this is a great way to visualize uh, affinity proteomics data. And uh, here you have, so these, each of these bubbles represents a protein that we saw in our data. On the y-axis, we have the full change that's in between the naive and the resistant cell line. And then uh, on the x-axis, we have this uh, NSAF, which is just a normalized uh, abundance, basically. So you're just looking at protein expression. These have already been filtered based on SAINT score, which is that software that does the Bayesian stuff and actually uh, uh, figures out how likely these interactions are. And so we use a fairly stringent cutoff, so we're pretty certain of what we're seeing here. We're also coloring by the, the crap ohm, so something that's uh, sort of a, I guess a yellowish brown color uh, is likely to be uh, something that's just very sticky or contaminant and pro but probably not likely a true hit. Things that are in red are more, much more likely to be true hits. Uh, and excitingly, uh, right here you can see, you can see this, this MET protein. Uh, so MET is a tyrosine kinase and it's interacting with this, this GRAB2. So this GRAB2 is an adapter protein. Uh, EGFR uh, expression is very important in lung cancer. It sits on the cell surface, it, becomes, it gets a mutation, it becomes activated, so it sends pro-survival signals to the cell. Um, you hit it with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, but eventually the cell develops resistance. How does it develop resistance? Well, one, me one mechanism is instead of this GRAB2, this adapter protein being associated with EGFR, it starts associating with a different receptor tyrosine kinase called MET. So this is kind of exactly the kind of data that we actually wanted to see, and it's kind of proof of principle that, that our experiment was working. And there was lots of literature just to sort of support this finding. This was just some, some data that we had laying around that wasn't published, because it's not, it's not very exciting, because this is also sort of the, the thing that you would expect, but it was great for, for proof of principle for our tool.
This is an actual figure. Um, so uh, within, this, within the Shiny environment, you can have these Cytoscape JS um, image, uh, uh, figures. You, know, you can drag these around. You can change the colorings on these. And then we can also do some pathway enrichment based on the list of proteins that you have in your data. And not surprisingly, we see ERBB signaling, which is related to epidermal growth factor receptor signaling, which is important in lung cancer, especially resistant models like we're looking at. And then you can also do the, the ontology and um, all the different protein classes. So we made this software that hopefully saves time and also allows you to do publication quality visualizations. I didn't mention it, but every figure that I showed you, you can output it. Um, well, so the network images can be output directly into Cytoscape. You can also save these images as a PNG or a TIFF or an EPS, up, up to 600 DPI, I believe. So these are publication quality coming right out of the tool, which minimizes the additional work that you, know, you or a biologist would have to do. So we uh, validated this tool. Uh, the manuscript is, is supposed to be going in, hopefully right now, so, so we'll see and uh, we have it available from, from these sources. And uh, I'd just like to thank the Lab Swyman, the uh, Eric Haro's lab, and then we work uh, closely with, with the Rich lab, and then also the, the Proteomics Core, and John Kuman, who's our Proteomics Director, but has his own research lab, and Stephen Eschrich is sort of my, my co-mentor. Uh, I go to Eric for, for biology and medical questions, and I go to Stephen for more, more programming and informatics and analysis questions. Uh, Brent and Adam, uh, Brent is a graduate student with Uva Ricks, and he did a lot of the work with Shiny. Uh, Adam is an undergraduate who actually uh, just left the lab to go to um, grad school for bioinformatics at, at UVA, so we're very proud of him. And then, so both of these guys are the, the, the co-first authors on, on this manuscript, so, so they, they deserve a lot of credit. I just sort of supervised and, and beat them to death with code reviews and, and things like that. So I'd be, I'd be happy, happy to take any questions. Thank you. question. So uh, you mentioned that this particular pipeline is, uh, I think I believe it's called uh, scaffold or MaxQuant. Oh, I'm sorry, say again? You use MaxQuant or scaffold outputs? Uh, uh, yeah, so it, it can take either one. So we have slightly separate workflows for Galaxy, uh, uh, excuse me, for scaffold or MaxQuant, but it essentially gets you to the same endpoint where you can do all these visualizations. Right. So it's, it's just that the formatting of the, the initial data is slightly different. Right. So inputs for Saint or Apostle uh, that you have, can, can they be more generic? Like, could you take uh, outputs from any other uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so this can pretty much take in anything. So SAN can accept both um, spectral counting data and intensity-based data. That's why we can do both scaffold and MaxQuant. Uh, we, we just happen to use MaxQuant and scaffold almost exclusively at our institution. So that, that's why that was sort of, you know, uh, sort of why the software is based on those two methods. Uh, I, I'd love to have it support, you know, all of the different softwares that are out there, but it's, it's difficult to me to justify my boss when I'm supposed to be, you know, analyzing proteomics data and coming up with biological conclusions to spend some time on a tool for software that we don't ever use at, in, in our institution. Okay. But yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks. Nice talk. Um, oh, thank you. Sort of a naive question. You did mention that mRNA level changes are not very predictive. Is there anything known about, um, so now we're starting to switch to, the, to these sort of ribosomal profiling based uh, high throughput sequencing methodologies. Is there anything known regarding how predictive those are of actual protein level changes if one does real protein modification? Oh, um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I, I can say that, that some, some groups have tried to uh, understand this and then so they did very careful um, modern monitoring of messenger RNA levels over time and how they associated with quantitative proteomics levels. And they, they looked and they could see, um, they can account for a lot of the sort of the variability or the, the poor correlations that you can see, uh, but not all of it. And I believe they were only doing total protein expression. And then so there's all sorts of other things and post-translational modifications that they didn't look at, uh, microRNAs. And then so, you know, you can probably add up all these different pieces and get to 100%, but we, really we don't understand sort of the, the magnitude of the contribution from each one of these and trying to understand not only how do they affect healthy tissues, but then also how do they get altered in diseases. And, and that's actually one, one of the questions that, that I'm, I'm interested in computationally is can you find something that maybe in a healthy cell is, um, correlates well, but in, in a disease or in cancer, it's, it's poorly correlated or it's dysregulated. So what does that mean? And then how is that being affected? And, but yeah, that's, that's kind of a, kind of a big question. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thanks. All right. Thank you.